first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I think uh, in light of the overall topic of the conference, uh, this session in particular, um, I'm hopeful that this report is uh, um, food for thought for your committee. Um, you've already got done the overview of the, uh, of the CEC. I won't uh, dwell on that. I do just want to underline that as an intergovernmental uh, organization, it's a little different beast. It's not an NGO. It's not an international organization. We're funded equally by the EPA the Canadian Ministry of the Environment and the Mexican Secretary or Secretary of the Environment, Samarnat. So uh, they pay our freight and uh, on occasion we do reports of an independent nature. This is the product of one of those exercises and it, it contains recommendations that we have made to our, our, our council, our board and the federal governments of our three countries. Um, I'm sure that Many of you are familiar with the many, many reports and studies that have examined the role of transportation in terms of the environment. Um, we've looked at this specifically from the perspective of environment and largely with respect to the CO2 issues that our previous speaker spoke of. I believe this is the first report, though, of this nature that has focused on this from a trinational perspective that integrates information and participation from each of our three countries with respect to the potential for freight transportation in particular to play a role in the mitigation of GHG uh, in our three countries. Um, so we're thankful for the participation of many, many uh, experts, officials at the state, provincial and federal level, as well as a robust uh, member, uh, number of uh, advisors that uh, participated in the report. Uh, you'll see some of them identified here, the American Trucking Association, FedEx, um, and the respective organizations in Canada and Mexico. Uh, the advisory group, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, broad-based and it consisted of uh, NGOs, uh, transportation officials, as well as state and federal uh, representatives from each of our three countries. Um, I'll skip straight to the conclusion uh, and then backtrack a little bit. But basically, uh, I think it's important and I think it's entirely appropriate with respect to the focus of your organization to underline that the, the finding that we find or the, the issue that we really identified as the most important requirement in avoiding the increases in freight-related GHG emissions anticipated as a consequence of continued growth and integration in the NAFTA region is not simply the continued progress that we've heard of in terms of cleaner and more efficient fuels and technologies, but a vision and a willingness at a political level and at a continental scale to look at freight transportation as a system and to treat it as a system that integrates each of our three economies. And that can play an integral role in greening the economy of the entire continent. Um, we also find very much, in, in, as consistent with our first speaker, that the policies, the regulations, the incentives, the investments, and the technologies that are necessary to accomplish more sustainable freight transportation across the continent will also make our economies more efficient, competitive, and energy secure. Uh, DOT Secretary Ray LaHood uh, has been noted to say that the transportation sector accounts for two-thirds of the United States oil use and contributes one-third of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions. He goes on to say that we have the type, or we have the opportunity and the obligation to take action. We can change both the types and amounts of energy that our transportation systems use while also creating good <coughs> high-paying jobs and easing everyone's burden at the pump. So we found a number of things as we did the analysis for this report. Um, some of this you've already, uh, previous speakers have identified, but we're looking at a circumstance here, looking out to 2030, uh, in which the NAFTA population, uh, our three countries combined, will grow to 540 million by 2030, 600 million by 2050, not that far off in terms of planning. Uh, the North American economy is expected to grow by 70 to 130 percent in that period. U.S. highway interstate travel demand, uh, we've heard the overall numbers uh, in terms of total vehicles. In terms of uh, VMT, uh, estimated to increase to 1.3 trillion miles by 2026. Uh, measured in trucks, it's another 1.8 to 2 million trucks on the road by 2020. 
Uh, total freight ton tonnage is expected to nearly double in this period. And uh, with all this, of course, comes increasing fuel use, emissions, congestion, and the impact on transportation infrastructure. It's an accelerating problem. We also find that when you look at on a modal share or just looking at it from a continental perspective as well, by value, 88% of U.S. trade with Canada and Mexico moves on land, and the majority of that is truck. Uh, North America, of course, globally is distinguished by the dominant role of trucks in land transportation, something like three to one uh, compared to other regions. In 2008, it's interesting to note that one half of the total truck value, in term, total truck traffic in terms of value, was handled at, by just three ports of entry. Uh, Detroit, Windsor, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, and Buffalo, Niagara Falls. And as you well know, there's significant issues with respect to congestion and delay. When you add the security considerations to the fact, it, it becomes increasingly complex. Uh, trucks, trans, trucks in general, truck transport in particular, plays a larger role in terms of uh, imports from Mexico, about 74% compared to Canada, 25%. There's more rail involved and pipeline, of course, with respect to Canada, U.S. trade. In terms of the transportation climate change relationship, the transport sector, as I mentioned before, is, is uh, very significant. It's second only to the electricity generating sector in terms of total CO2 emissions produced. CO2, of course, is about 98 or 95 percent of the emissions of freight-related um, transportation. That this is the, the the number one problem that we're facing. Um, the problem is, is of course, is that uh, freight is the fastest-growing source of emissions in the transportation sector, and that um, in in historic terms as well, U.S. freight-related emissions increased by 74 percent alone from 1990 to 2008. Now, it's also the case that it should be observed, and this, I know this is of important to your, uh, your um, citizens, is that uh, when you tackle CO2 at a, at a policy level, you're also dealing with significant uh, co-benefits in terms of air quality and health benefits in particular, uh, which is a very important public health matter. Um, it's also, you know, we could go into the report in more detail looking at the respective performance of the three countries. Mexico is a slightly different profile in terms of the degree of motorization, but overall we're looking here at the, at the situation from a continental perspective. Now here's the kicker. Um, this is the problem. Fuel standards will not do the job. They're not enough. The freight truck sector in particular is, is amenable, highly amenable, to efficiency improvements as a consequence of new technology, better technology, and driven in part by environmental standards. Um, last year, you'll, you'll note that uh, President Obama announced that the United States uh, would establish GHG emission standards for commercial, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles. This is a very significant announcement from an environmental perspective. And I'm very pleased to note that Canada has made a very comparable announcement, or an announcement of comparable standards in the near future, beginning with model year 2016. And uh, Mexico is uh, currently examining this, and we are optimistic that in the relatively near future, we will have a comprehensive and comparable heavy duty, medium heavy duty fuel standard uh, throughout North America, which is a very significant environmental accomplishment. Now the problem is, is that though, uh, when you look at it from a, a modal perspective though, notwithstanding the very significant uh, uh, progress that we expect to continue to see in medium and light uh, vehicle um, uh, usage, the problem is, is that despite uh, the increase in VMT, we're going to see those numbers go down overall. But the problem is, is that in transportation and in trucks in particular, we're going to see a 20% increase in emissions over this period. So it's going in entirely the wrong direction relative to volume over time. The problem, of course, is that uh, notwithstanding the technology and the improvements in uh, efficiency, that largely this is a consequence of volume, that we're dealing with more trucks hauling more goods to more people over more miles uh, over the next 20 years. So we have to look at a portfolio of policies and practices to deal with this issue. Whoops. 
Okay. Um, we identified a number of challenges. I won't uh, dwell on these uh, from a transportation policy perspective. Uh, you'll be familiar with many of them. I want to just itemize a couple that I think the committee may be interested in. Uh, as I mentioned, technology is a significant source of the uh, uh, opportunity for uh, resolving this issue. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the uptake particularly in the freight industry, is slower than we would like. Uh, we're not talking about the family vehicle where people will turn these over every two or three years. The EPA has estimated that it may well take until 2030 to convert all the trucks on the road to green engines. So this is a very significant capital investment, and it is a uh, one that takes over a much longer period of time. The other issue, of course, is, is uh, as, as we heard earlier from uh, Brian, is infrastructure. Um, Many have noted that uh, at a continental scale, our infrastructure is not being adequately supported, that transportation systems are not being expanded and modernized at rates that are comparable to our major trading blocks, uh, our competitors in other trading blocks, and that uh, North America does need to make a significant and comparable investment to maintain and modernize its infrastructure. China is spending something like 9% of GDP on infrastructure. India is looking at 3.5. The U.S., it was noted in our study, spends something less than 1%. Uh, admittedly, the United States is starting from a much higher level in terms of its uh, uh, assets. But nonetheless, uh, it is noted that we are probably losing ground and facing a significant challenge as we move forward. The report, uh, I began with our number one recommendation, but I'll just conclude by, by, by noting that we make a number of recommendations um, that I think are also very significant in light of the discussion at this conference in general. The number one being coordination and networking, the, the importance of looking at the transportation system in North America as such, and particularly when you're dealing with the issues of logistics, the border, and so on. I'm pleased to note that uh, just yesterday, the uh, first Mexican truck under the uh, revised agreement between Mexico and the United States uh, came across the border. This has been a bit of unfinished NAFTA business that's taken about 17 years, 16, 17 years to resolve. Uh, we'll see how that fares, uh, but uh, it did happen, and as a result, uh, the last billion or so in tariffs on U.S. goods came off, and uh, hopefully this will be uh, something that we can look forward to more of in the future. Um, we also talk, and, and it's important to note that when we began this report, we were very much looking at this from a GHG perspective, looking at how uh, the transportation sector could play a role in terms of each nation's targets around uh, climate change policy. Um, this is a slightly different environment today politically than it was two years ago. Nonetheless, we make the point that carbon pricing and system efficiency strategies are essential in terms of a level playing field for everybody in the transportation sector. Uh, we talk about investments to improve the efficiency of the system. We talk about the importance of supply chain management from a carbon perspective. Training is a significant issue that I think there's room for opportunity. Eco-driver training in particular, operator uh, uh, training. And finally, gathering and sharing data at a North American level. We simply don't have good and consistent information on performance at this, of the sector uh, that is comparable uh, when you include Canada, Mexico, and the United States. So there's some significant uh, achievements that could be made in that regard. Um, other than that, I will be uh, happy to take any questions that you may have. I should say that we have, uh, it's been about six or seven months since we produced the report. As I say, we've made these recommendations to our fed respective federal governments, and uh, we're working now through our various uh, contacts at uh, the transportation and environmental agencies to continue a dialogue with them about how we might be able to support them in moving along this path. Thank you.